In a, a whirlwind fashion, I'm going to be just touching on motivation for system science. I'm then going to be talking what is this, what is the system science enterprise that we're talking about. And I want to highlight the shared characteristics that lie behind those three types of modeling we saw this morning, which may seem like solitude, seem like fragmented, totally different approaches with very little in common. In fact, they have a lot in common. They have more in common than they do in distinctions in some ways. And so we talked about those. And, and as time allows, potentially briefly comment on, on each of them and provide some take home messages. Okay? Um, so, you know, in my, in my view, the, uh, much of the motivation um, for the application of system science approaches in health lies in the fact that we're, we're, we're trying to grapple with and confront ever more complex health challenges. And, and you know, do, no matter where one is in the world, in the developing world, in, in industrialized countries, um, uh, whether it's in the southern hemisphere or northern, uh, Canada, Australia, um, Europe, um, the U.S., et cetera, um, there's, you know, we're, we're, we're struggling to help chart healthier futures through very different, uh, very difficult circumstances. Circumstances where, you know, we have an aging population and there's there's great comorbidity, uh, burden of comorbidities in that context. Um, we're a shrinking world. Um, you know, the fact that I'm here from Midwestern Canada to deliver lectures in these two weeks is a reflection of just how small the world has become in some respects, even more so you know, the fact that my lectures from this room will be listened to by thousands of people over the course of, of coming years is an indic indication of the interconnections in place. And, you know, when it comes to uh, communicable diseases, these, these interconnections have become the most obvious. The emergence of things like um, MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory um, Syndrome, or SARS, um, even the emergence of, of avian flu and swine flu, the emergence associated with uh, HIV decades past as zoonoses and then spreading around the world is a reminder of how, how, how small this world is in terms of, of the set of health issues. Um, and at the same time, uh, we're very aware of the fact that we have glaring health disparities that burden our, our populations and that trouble our consciences. Um, there's, you know, syndemics between mutually interacting conditions that afflict many of the same basic communities. So often we'll have communities, for example, in Saskatchewan's north that are, that are or in Canada's north more broadly, that are simultaneously afflicted by, by staggeringly high rates of diabetes. For example, a majority of women over 55 from Aboriginal ancestry being suffering from diabetes within our province. Um, and at the same time, very high rates of TB compared to the rest of the province. High rates associated also with, with conditions as varied as STIs or end-stage renal disease. Um, and you know, in many areas, there's, um, there's an interaction of social issues and health issues. So substance <laughs> abuse, crime, poverty, suicide, um, Meryl Singer, the author of the book Syndemics, which is beautiful, beautiful example of, of systems thinking applied to health, you know, talks about substance abuse and violence and AIDS uh, and addictions being tied up in these vicious cycles, um, each sort of contributing to the other. Domestic violence, alcohol abuse, um, and, and uh, suicide and, and depression, uh, adverse mental health. Um, these interactions in chronic and communicable illness. We also know that um, when it comes to health disparities, since the work of Barker in, in, with, with the Manchester uh, population and subsequently work including components we've contributed to in our work, that, um, that there are, are very uh, long shadows cast by early life insults, by, by traumatic experiences in early life, but also by things as seemingly innocuous as, as um, high or low birth weights, um, uh, deprivation while uh, in the womb, 
there are these critical periods and life long long term effects of early life insults and chronic disease trajectories and health outcomes that play out decades and decades later. And increasingly, our attention is drawn to intergenerational and, and epigenetic effects. We're increasingly also dealing with multiple outcome, multiple complication conditions, these multifactorial diseases like diabetes and obesity. The result not from one, you know, one specific <laughs> pathway, but from a whole confluence of, of different uh, things. And increasingly, you know, we're working to counteract the effects of ever more nimble, um, ever more nimble corporate actors. And you know, traditional techniques, um, traditional RCTs and um, statistical techniques such as uh, survival analysis, competing risks analysis, and linear and, and logistic regression, et cetera, have secured us tremendous insights. Um, they've real, been real key assets in, in helping, helping us to grapple with these challenges. Um, but at the same time, <coughs> They've traditionally focused um, their efforts on just part of the puzzle, to wit, understanding the pieces of the system, understanding particular pathways, understanding, you know, uh, with RCTs, understanding the impact of a drug under very tightly circumscribed controlled conditions, um, you know, uh, understanding the impact of risk factors on certain focused outcomes. Um, and an associational basis. And, and that offers, you know, great, great appreciation for sort of the extent of disparities and some of the associations in place. But, you know, it's provided limited understanding the links between what's known at the micro level, at the level of an individual, the macro, the meso level, and, and the meso level, uh, and the macro level, in turn, the level of the whole population. And critically, it's provided limited insight into the understanding of how counterfactual policy <coughs> trade-offs, policy trade-offs for which there's no statistical data because they've never been in place before, new neighborhood forms, aspects of new food environments and new built environments, how will they likely shape these patterns? And you know, if we seek to make decisions that will improve the, the state of the population, if we seek to make decisions that will bend the curve, that will change the health futures that we're going to experience, we're going into uncharted territory where there's not those associations which have been picked up because we're in a whole new area. We've changed the data generating process. We've changed sort of, uh, we're changing the process by which um, the underlying processes of the system in ways we don't have statistical data and we need to understand how all these pieces come together and affect the whole. It's almost as if, um, you know, if, if you were to consider a very prosaic issue, let's say, um, uh, let's say issues uh, on our streets, you can be an expert in how you can take the world's greatest mechanic, right, an expert in how car engines work and how 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 the drivetrain works and different types of vehicles who can repair just about anything at that level and knows all about it. And you could pair them up with someone, or you could consider them in isolation. You could consider in isolation a person who is a road engineer and understands something about how roads curve and how that affects visibility, how it affects safety and the speed of cars on the road. And you could have someone who you know, is an expert in, in sort of road layout, et cetera. And each of them provides great great uh, value to the system, but you know, n none of them in isolation is going to be able to give you an understanding of why traffic jams form. Right? Traffic jams are a collective phenomenon. They're not about the drivetrain of one individual. They're not about its engine type. They're not about just the curvature of the roadway. They're not purely about the layout of the street or about the networks of streets. They, they're entangling of all those issues. Yes, people slow down and they, they drive slower in adverse weather and they, they drive slower around curves and, you know, surely cars breaking down has something to do with traffic jams. If you want to understand traffic jams, though, it's not just about the pieces. All those things are surely important, but they're all tangled. You have to understand how the pieces combine to form the whole. How do those things come together to link in? And, you know, um, and for dealing with traditional techniques, 
Um, we have difficulty applying them to situations where we have highly heterogeneous populations where there's long times between you know, the, the cause and the effect, long delays, perhaps decades in the making, between early life insults and later life consequences, where there's reciprocal causality in place, you know, where, where the weight affects physical activity and physical activity of, uh, affects weight, where physical activity affects diet and diet in turn uh, can, can, can influence thinking about kids' physical activity where we have these, this phenomena, Winston Churchill would say, we build our buildings and then our buildings build us. And so it is with our social networks. We pick those, we, we hang around, and then they shape our social norms. And if we're thinking about interventions that shape our buildings, our built environment, or that shape our social networks, we need to understand something about that reciprocal causality, about how that works, the feedbacks in place. We need to understand the effects of those delays. We need to understand the effects of the nonlinearities in the system. How is it that you know, a, a certain investment in intervention may yield a certain gain, but investing twice as much doesn't necessarily translate to twice as much gain? it may yield four times as much gain, or may yield only 10% additional gain. We know that within the context of health issues, there are these big nonlinearities. And you know, for seeking to, to really uh, rigorously assess drivers for patterns that you see in the population, if we're seeking to evaluate the impact of novel interventions where the statistical data isn't available, or we're reasoning about implementation science, sustainability, logistics of challenges, training. There's only so much we can do with a, a linear regression model to tease, tease apart the associations. We are changing the data generating process, so those associations may be different. We need to understand how that will change things. And if we under, want to understand behavioral responses to interventions, how would people choose differently um, about physical activity and how would that ripple through to physical activity and weight consequences in a novel built environment, we need, we need a different, uh, an additional set of tools to complement our, our toolboxes. And you know, if we're working in, in diabetes and obesity area, traditionally there's a lot of attention to the biomedical side, but we know it's nested in a whole series of different contexts that are profound in terms of shaping people's outcomes, people's choices in conditioning how they make decisions, how they spend their time, and how much physical activity they can get and the level of nutrition um, that they take into. So there are these layers of issues that start perhaps with biomedical, but evolve even at the physiological level, these complex feedbacks. The fact that, you know, if I try to lose weight, I, I may cut down my calories that may gain a certain amount of weight loss early on, but increasingly my body becomes efficient. It goes into this mode where it tries to conserve energy. A starvation response kicks in, and it makes it harder to lose each additional pound. Or, alternatively, if we're thinking about gaining weight, that first time you gain, gain weight and become quite heavy, there's a whole set of processes take place that, that mean it's easier to regain weight the next time. Even if you lose it, you can regain it. There's, there's these feedbacks that lead to cycling of weight over time that have been sketched out at the physiologic level but are entangled with these societal issues. There's diverse actors in place at various stages, <clears throat> and then there's these networks at various levels social networks, the built environment, the food environment, the communicational environment, and it for some for some individuals aspect of course, for example, a school environment, etc. And you know, the shifting knowledge, norms, attitudes, and beliefs here, and you know, possible uh, inter, uh, inter, inter intergenerational and epigenetic roles that, that some of our work has helped highlight. You know, and the, the indication here is when we're in these systems with this entangled causality, these different levels of context, different levels of scale, different levels of entangled sort of processes, we see these effects like we do with the traffic jam, when the whole is greater than some of its parts. By understanding each car in isolation, you're not going to understand a traffic jam. It's a different type of phenomenon. 
it's, it's not about the pieces, it's about how they all come together to form the whole. And these sort of systems effects are what we see increasingly in the world and we have to respond to at the health level and that's what increasingly we turn to system science methods to try to deal through, to try to deal with. The patterns that are seen at this, these emergent patterns, these patterns resulting from pieces of the system or the system as a whole are very different from what we see at any one piece. But if we want to nudge the system, if we want to bend the curve, if we want to change things, we need to be able to anticipate them. We need to be able to understand if we want to prevent traffic jams, we have to understand how they form and how they are influenced by street design, yes, by, by the, uh, the car types on the road, yes, but also the road network, also aspects of the street lights, et cetera, those are all entangled. We need to understand where they come from. Um, one of the uses of, of that, one of the things that, that is difficult in this area is to, with these complex systems, these systems where the whole is greater than some of the parts, is to explain what's going on. You know, is the evidence that we see before us, is it supportive of a hypothesis we have, maybe a working hypothesis, some theory we have about, about how the built environment affects people's behavior? Um, Another question though is, you know, where's the situation likely to go next? What, what's driving the situation and where is it likely to go? Um, and is even what I'm seeing a, a good or bad thing? Um, you know, are these, these higher rates of incidence that we see for reportable disease, uh, say reportable illness, or is that something which, um, which is a, an adverse thing, indicative of higher incidence levels, more occurrence in the underlying population? Or is it instead a good thing? It's an indication that, that uh, we've got better and better reporting going on. If we want to explain those things, we need to understand something about how these patterns result from all these different factors, with reporting being part of it, with, um, with the actual underlying incidents being another part, et cetera. And we know that in the health area, what's going on is complicated. We see, you know, in many domains, these structures that are just like a traffic jam. They're not, they're not about the pieces, they're about the whole. We see you know, these, these uh, you know, uh, patterns, the uh, epi curves, they've come to be called, which exhibit these classic patterns of rise and fall, almost a bell-shaped curve in this case. With child and infectious diseases, whether you look at Wales or central Canada, you, you tended to see before the advent of, of, um, uh, of widespread vaccination, these, these spikes and levels of incident, followed by stasis, followed by spikes, um, which were indicative of, of uh, uh, spread of, of, of flu, or, well, excuse me, this is measles, mumps, uh, chicken pox also exhibited similar trends, uh, as did pertussis. We know that in many of these systems, trying to understand what's going on requires reasoning about the coupling of different parties, say a, a caregiver and a child, where you know, uh, child well-being and caregiver well-being are so coupled together that to try to separate them is really difficult. And if we want to reason about infant and, uh, infant and child's on the one hand and maternal mental health, we need to understand this, this coupling. We know since the work of Christakis and Fowler, although uh, it defies a trivial explanation and while much of their work has been rightfully criticized for over-interpreting some patterns, that there are these nested network contexts, even not only of pathogen-driven diseases, but of, of diseases such as obesity. Um, conditions such as obesity, there's, there's these linkages statistically, these associations between my likelihood of developing obesity and that of my neighbors uh, within the network that, that require explanation. And Ross Hammond, among others, has done some very thoughtful work looking at possible explanations. We know in many cases that illnesses are, are spatially mediated, that there are these large areas where illnesses concentrate and other areas where the burden of illness is, is much less. And whether it's STIs uh, or, or zoonoses, we know that spatial, spatial patterning is very important for certain types of explanations if we want to understand and explain what is going on. 
These patterns are all structured, but they're very different from what we see in any one piece of the system. They sort of represent emergence from a complex system that, that, that gives rise to them. But again, anticipating, understanding, and heading off certain types of emergence is central <coughs> if we want to change things. And this brings me to the next major goal um, that, that is difficult within complex systems, which is a need to intervene. You know, if we're dealing with a complex system, if we're not sure why we see traffic jams forming, it's hard to figure out how to ameliorate them, where to best intervene, how to intervene, how soon will I see effects of intervening, how do I scale up an intervention. These are all very practical challenges that are difficult to address in complex systems using traditional techniques. We know that, for example, bridging individuals play a very important role in transmitting not just pathogen, but norms, attitudes, beliefs. Um, we know that people in core areas of networks can have a disproportionate effect in shaping the behavior of the whole. As it were, the tail can wag the dog. Small members of a very heterogeneous group, a small subset of the population can have disproportionate effect. And uh, very importantly, we know there are tipping points for many systems. If we can only invest enough, we might see a qualitative change in the outcomes for health issues of concerns. We see this very strongly, of course, and have for decades appreciated this, associated with herd immunity for, for infections. If we could just vaccinate enough people in the population, the thought is, even if the rest are susceptible, even though each individual in the population who's susceptible still be susceptible, can still get the bug, the disease can't spread in the population. It's again a collective feature, it's an emergent feature of the system. It's a systems level effect. Each person who's, who's not been vaccinated may be susceptible, but the population as a whole is resistant. And we know that these sort of tipping points are not unique to communicable disease. They occur with chronic disease risk factors as well. They occur as well with respect to organizational factors, with respect to, to even projects. And tipping points give us hope. They suggest to us if we can just do the set of right things, just a little bit more investment may pay off, and it will totally change the character of what we're dealing with, totally change the nature of the game. We're seeing a lot of hope for that for tobacco. It's a tough end game there, but there's reason to believe that we may be successful in, in greatly reducing the burden of, of tobacco in, in many countries worldwide. At the same time, you know, dealing with uh, the effects of these long delays uh, in terms of outcomes um, is challenging. We have to deal with the fact that there's feedbacks in place and with very long delays that, that can pose real challenges. And so when we're dealing with these complex systems, ladies and gentlemen, we, you know, we have challenges in understanding how to change things, difficulties in understanding how to explain things. And these can lead to counterintuitive behavior of a system, behavior that surprises us, throws it off, misperceptions of what's going on in a system, interpreting something that's a good sign as a bad sign. Policy resistance, cases where we invest and where our policies are diluted or defeated by the system itself. We're working against the nature of things, butting our head up against a brick wall, when really we could be putting our energy to something more, more effective. And at the same time, we may be unaware of tipping points. If we could only take advantage of them, it could be a game changer. And all these phenomena pose real challenges for learning from experience learning from the experience in Sydney, to how to apply it best in Melbourne, or learning from the experience in Melbourne and how to apply it to Adelaide. It, 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 ha it imposes problems in terms of coordination of different components of a system, planning and deciding, you know, what should we invest in? The trade-off is unclear if we're working purely with traditional tools in the context of complex systems, and in designing a system that's more robust, whether it's whether to amalgamate health regions within the Canadian context, um, uh, or whether it's um, designing feedback that might be helpful in, in terms of managing 
uh, outbreaks of, of, um, of foodborne illness. So I'd like to now talk about system science. So, you know, the reflection here is that the patterns we went through, those, those curves, those spatial patterns, those patterns in networks, those don't come from nowhere. They're not isolated fragments. They're not solitudes. They result from some underlying processes to give rise to all of them. And the, the patterns that we see in ill health, as distressing as they are, they're reflective of, of processes that are entangling many factors. And to really understand why these patterns persist and resist efforts, the conviction associated with system science is that we need to be able to reason consistently about the processes that give rise to them. We need to go beyond noting associations and need to ask why do we see those associations? What process is generating those associations? And while this is a, a big challenge, absent this, we, we risk working at cross purposes with the nature of things. We kind of, we risk sort of being like King Canute trying to hold, you know, order back the tide, where that's just not in the nature of things for us to be able to do that. There's certain things that we can do that will be helpful, and we need to understand the underlying system to figure out which interventions will work together well and which will work across purposes, for example. So system science, I like to term it the science of the whole. It's the science of phenomena like traffic jams, phenomena like herd immunity. These phenomena that, that are not merely reducible to the pieces, but instead are aspects of the entangling of all these pieces. And system science is a broad set of methods that can help us visualize, understand, and reason about the implications about underlying processes and, and test the consistency. And I think this is absolutely key from my perspective. Test the consistency of our theories about what might be going on, our hypotheses. Test to what degree they're consistent with evidence. And primary way, certainly a, a very important way of doing this within system science is through these use of what I term dynamic models. And we'll, we'll introduce some other terms to those in just a sec. And these models basically represent how things out there might work, how they work out there in the population. Or, or if they work, if they were to work this way, what would the implications of it be? These models serve as thinking tools, or as Jeff likes to put it, think, thinking prostheses. They're kind of labs for refining our thinking. Is our thinking in line with how, how things are likely to be? And, and they'll help identify for us gaps in our thinking and cases where our thinking is off more quickly. So these models don't tell us what is going on out there in the world, but they'll more quickly help us identify inconsistencies between what we think might be going on there and what actually is by helping us more quickly identify inconsistencies between that thinking, that hypothesis, and the evidence that's available. Okay? Um, they also serve as tools to share our assumptions, to make them explicit, to put our assumptions down in a way that will take them out of our head where they're kind of hidden from others put them out in an open form where they can be examined, critiqued, refined collectively in advance. So it provides a way of sort of going beyond a situation where you have your theory and I have mine and we kind of argue about it but in unclear terms and putting it out there so we can examine the consequences, ask if it's consistent with the evidence and, and critique it openly and, and advance it. And there's a number of signs advancing a system science approach that I'd like to put up here. This is one of the slides that I think is very important. I provided it to you as part of the background material, um, as part of sort of the, the set of props, because many students come to me with problems. And some of the problems they come with are system science, are really good fit to system science. And sometimes they come to me with problems which are not particularly good fit to system science, where I might say, well, why don't you use survival analysis for that problem? Or, or why don't you go off and you know, apply a logistic regression um, for that situation? Um, there are certain features of a, of a system that have fancy names, um, but I'll try to explicate them in the course of this week um, in, in concrete terms that do point to system science being valuable, needed, advised. And I've put up some of them here. I've commented on many of them. 
Um, and I, and you know, I'll, I'll try to note in the course of the week when certain ones come up. Okay. Um, okay. Let's talk about dynamic models. That's one of those key tools of system science. So simulation models, those simulation models we looked at this morning and others like them, others of their ilk, these represent basically hypothesized causal relationships um, by which diverse factors are hypothesized to interact over time, okay? They sort of capture possible theory of, of what could be going on in the world, for example, um, in causal terms, what might be influencing what. And these models provide a way to examine the diverse system-wide consequences of often counterfactual changes in areas of the system. That's why it's so important that they be posit causal relationships. You understand how changing A affects changing affects B and how that in turn might affect C. So we can ask, you know, if we affect if we change A in ways we might not have examined before, how might it ripple through to changes in B and C and many other factors? No, these models at a high level help us and other system actors to understand system vulnerabilities, where, where it might be risky, where you know, if there's an economic downturn, we might have our whole plan fall apart, where there are leverage points. If we can only invest in this area, it might make a big difference. Ways we might change system structure and, and highlight ways to, that we could work together. So, so what are these models? They go by very many names, and this is one of the big confusions about models. They go by different names in different subdisciplines. Sometimes they're called mathematical models. Sometimes they're called causal models. Different from statistical causal models, which I also work with, but they're a different type of beast. Um, sometimes they're called models of the physics of the system. Mechanistic models is a term I tend to like. They, they depict kind of the, the mechanics of the system. Sometimes they're called models of the plumbing of the system. They depict the underlying processes, okay? Um, so the defining goals sort of examine the dynamic behavior resulting from hypothesized causal structure. If we had this, what would the implications be in terms of behavior over time? Um, and here, and you know, using a bit of statistical terminology, they're typically depicting, the model depicts a often mostly latent state, we can only observe certain pieces of it, and they simulate, regardless of whether it's a system dynamics model, a discrete event model, or a, an agent-based model, what they do is they simulate step-by-step -step evolution of the state of the system over time. Whether it's the people flowing through those pathways of care in that trauma center, whether it's people in that GIS model going and seeking food, whether it's aspects associated with uh, the, the flow of individuals into a care facility in that system dynamics model, they all share in common that they start at some initial posited state and then they simulate the evolution of the entire system over time in a step-by-step -step fashion. Step-by-step -step is sometimes discrete steps, sometimes it's continuous time, but the system is evolving as a whole over time. So we can stop it at any one time and ask, what's the current state of the system at that time? Now, because this model captures positive causality, there's no free lunch here. We don't know for sure what's going on. But if we posit a certain causality, we can see what the outcomes would be for counterfactual scenarios. But we can also run the model and see if it jives with the evidence. Does it align with the evidence that we have available? Does it, does, is it consistent with what we know? And thereby find inconsistencies between what we posit to be the case causally and what actually is observed out there. Inconsistencies that we wouldn't have identified if it just stayed in our head. The, the computer is, computers, ladies and gentlemen, I stand, stand in front of you as a computer scientist. And uh, I will happily tell you, as a professor of computer science, computers are very dumb. They are dumb. They can do some things quickly, and we're getting better at having them be a little bit clever about some things, but they tend to be very dumb. But there's some things they do extremely well. And those are dumb, simple things done over and over again. 
And one of those things is simulating model. By contrast, we as people tend to be pretty poor about doing that in our head. We're really good at a lot of things. We're great at other things. But one of the things we are not very good at is thinking completely consistently and logically about how a system will evolve over time as conceived they're ahead. Even the most highly trained folks in uh, SDEM, the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, if you give them a description of one of these models and, see, and you said plot out what this will do over time, they make terrible mistakes, terrible mistakes. John Sturman and others in system dynamics have studied this for decades. And it's, it's amazing the sort of mistakes people make. Um, people who, like me, were graduate students and, and STEM subjects at MIT we make all sorts of mistakes. We say, oh, you know, it, it'll be doing this, and we're, we're all wet um, about what it will be doing. We're not very good about thinking about it in our head. So in a dynamic model, what do you specify? The initial state of the model, there's some initial state, some initial starting status of the model. In an agent-based model, it's where each person start the state that they're in, the current situation that they're in, the, the status where they're located, maybe in GIS, their internal status. Uh, in a system dynamics model, it's the starting values of all those stocks, those accumulations. Um, and in a DES model, be how many people are in each queue, what's the number of resources, et cetera. And then there's going to be some rules that indicate how the state changes based on the current state. Now that may sound, sound circular. Well, wait a minute. We're not. We're, what we're saying is, based on the current situation, what will the change be over the next little bit of time? And system dynamics is specified with these things called flows. So those are those flows into and out of a state, of those stocks, those those accumulations. So we say, if there's you know 100 people in the ward right now, how many would be discharged in the next day? And you have a mean time they spend in the ward, and you divide the number of the ward by that mean time, and that gives you a number that you'd expect to, to, to leave in the next day. Um, uh, in an agent base model, what you'll specify is those hazard rates, for example, of going from one state to the next. Remember that? So we saw someone who was in pre diabetes state, they had a transition to the diabetes state. Do you remember that one? And we specified a rule for that hazard rate. How does it depend on their age? How does it depend on their current physical activity level? How does it depend on their current weight? How does it depend on their accumulated history of weight? Their sort of obesity exposure, something that our work as well as work of, of others has identified as, as really important based on um, survival analysis or, 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 um, or um, competing risks analysis. And so there's rules in the model that indicate how does the change depend on the current state? Rules at the level of an individual for an agent-based model, rules at the level of flows, rules in the form of, of sort of times in, in discrete event simulation. And from this sort of specification, from the initial state and these rules, saying how do you go from state to state, from state to the change in state, then the simulation package can automatically, the computer can do its simple dumb thing. It can figure out how it goes from one point in time to the next, to the next, to the next. And that's what it's doing. When it's simulating the model, it's totaling these things up, figuring out what's the next state, and then figures that it's changed the next and the next state beyond that. Okay, um, so the model is depicting this evolving state. You specify these incremental changes in state. The system behavior is emergent. This is very important. We don't specify what this model will do over time in a, in a we don't specify the functional form of it. We don't specify in closed form it will be going up exponentially like this, or it will be going up linearly like that. That's something which emerges from the model. It emerges from the interaction, how the current state yields a change of state, which yields the next state. And there, because of that, perhaps it goes up exponentially in the model. But it's not because we told it to. It's because it emerges from the implications of these rules about the current state and how the changes are based on it, just like it does in the world. Traffic jam emerges from the interaction of, of these different situations associated with cars and road networks and traffic lights and so on. So it is with the model. Okay? So model behavior over time can't be specified here in closed form. It can't give a formula for it. It emerges from the model. Um, and because the underlying systems are nonlinear, um, typically the models are uh, as well. Now, this stuff is all par for the course in many domains. Um, 
You would never fly in a, want to fly in a plane um, if the pilot hadn't undergone extensive work experiencing how planes behave under thunderstorms. But airlines don't let their pilots go up for the first time in a thunderstorm and fly their planes through it. Instead, what they do is they put them in a flight simulator, right? They have to undergo the flight simulator. And this is par for the course in many, many areas of engineering and science. You use simulators to lower risk. Um, and so it is in health. It's just we're, we're you know, working towards that level of widespread use. We're not, we're not yet there fully, fully there yet. But increasingly in clinical training, for example, simulators are used. They're central to the training of, of doctors these days. And increasingly at the public health level, there's that recognition. Now, this is an absolutely key slide. And for this slide, I am, again, indebted to Jeff for his terminology. So last year, about this time, a couple weeks earlier, I uh, terribly broke, uh, broke my foot and, and sprained my ankle. I had two foot breaks and a sprained ankle. And I was down, um, down, in, down for the count for several months. And uh, for the first little bit, I went around with crutches um, and cane. Uh, and it got me aware of the importance of prostheses. These, these tools, like canes, the crutches, that complement our limitations, right? We have a limitation like your foot is broken, you have a sprained ankle. And so, you, you have this tool that helps make up for that limitation. And so it is with simulation models. They help us make up for our limitations and our noggins. Um, they help us learn more quickly by helping us think through the implications of our assumptions, more assumptions about how things might work out there, or could work more consistently, reliably, and rigorously, rigorously um, or quickly. We can think through those implications more quickly than if we were to just do it in our head and more consistently and more thoroughly. And this is key, thereby allowing us to, to spot the degree to which they're consistent with whatever empirical evidence that we have and to put that evidence to better use. Better use in identifying inconsistencies in our thinking, better use in terms of what's the implication for system behavior over time. So models are sometimes held up wrongly as sort of um, uh, used in, as an alternative to data. Um, you use data or you use models. And uh, there is some way that each gives some unique um, contributions, but models typically allow us to use the evidence that we do have more effectively. They allow us to spot the inconsistencies between our hypotheses about the world and evidence more quickly. And they allow us to incorporate that evidence so we can ask what if questions about the implications of that evidence. So we can use these to inform our choices, our decision making about counterfactuals, and to advance our understanding. Okay. Um, uh, and what data to collect. They can help us prioritize what data should we invest in collecting. So the models here are part of a, an enterprise um, that is quite broad. It's not unique to just kind of the modeling sitting in front of the computer. It does involve having a mental model, some idea in our head, we capture in a unambiguous, precisely specified form. We see the dynamic implications and we say, does that jive with what we think and what we have known to be going on empirically? And we go through this process of refining the model and, and embellishing it, extending it. And, and critically, our mental model is a key deliverable. We refine our thinking. And then we also undertake actions or new observations in the world. And based on that, we further refine our mental model. So model here is a learning tool. It helps capture kind of the current thinking. And if there is a gap between what the model says and what empirically observed, it is an opportunity to learn. It's not a failure of the model. It's a success of the model lane that we've been able to learn, oh, this is gap between what I thought was the case and what, what is actually known. Either that tells us something about what, what I think is the case is off, or maybe there's an issue with the data. And there are many cases where I've seen both occur. My, my understanding of the world improves greatly because of that. I've identified that gap. Or when I really go back 
and talk with the people responsible for the data, they tell me that data is unreliable for those periods of time, and I wouldn't have known that otherwise. So models help us help us learn more quickly from the world and more deeply. Um, the quote that Jeff likes to give here is one from uh, Francis Bacon. What, 15th, 15th century, 16th century? 16th? Um, and uh, Francis Bacon wrote um, these words in Latin, which I, I need to memorize, but um, currently is, is, is not uh, on the tip of my tongue. But he basically said, it is easier to evolve truth from error than from confusion. Now, that sounds outlandish, evolving truth from error. But what basically he was saying is, it's easier to go try something and be honest if you've made a mistake, see the results, be honest about you've made a mistake and learn from it, than to just sit back and not try something. It's better to be transiently wrong than to be perpetually confused. With a model, we have a systematic way of replacing confusion. You know, is my thinking consistent with the evidence? What is the evidence saying by, by learning? And, you know, Modeling like this supports theorizing concerning what's going on out there, and they aid in theory building, testing and refinement, and understanding the implications of that theory for counterfactuals. Um, and the thought here is even putting forward a poor starting model often advances knowledge by allowing us to spot inconsistencies and working towards a better knowledge. So models here, in my view, ladies and gentlemen, are not these crystal balls that are either correct or shattered because they have failed. Models are learning tools. There are ways we capture our current best guesses as to what might be going on, and or this is one of the main ways they serve, um, current best guesses to what's going on, and they serve as a way to learn more quickly and effectively and deeply from evidence. And they evolve. They evolve with learning over time, and they become more appropriate, more, more capable of capturing um, the, the phenomena that we're trying to understand, and more and more able to sort of help us refine our thinking um, ever further. So a model is part of a living sort of process of learning, uh, often at an institutional level and at the level of a field. Now, my colleagues, Ross Hammond, um, uh, excuse me, Ross to a certain degree, but especially um, Josh Epstein at, at Hopkins and Don Burke, at, at, who's the Dean of the School of Public Health at Pitt, have created lists of dozens of uses for, for dynamic models, for simulation models. And I won't try to reproduce them here. I will just note that models are used in several different fashions. They are used to build theory they are used to understand the implications of theory for the consequences of different interventions. Ross Hammond talks about retrospective modeling and prospective modeling. And um, in this context, uh, simulation models are, are often used to build theory when the evidence is less, is, is less established, we're kind of Work or, or the, the theory is less established. We're thinking through possible theories. And then once that theory is more established, it can be used to ask these what if questions for, to identify desirable policies. Where desirable is defined in leverage or cost effectiveness or robustness for certain uncertainties like about the state of the economy um, or uncertainties evolving, um, changing, uh, changing sort of policy regimes, etc. cetera. Um, and you know, models can also help us understand trends as well, prioritize research and data collection, and understand classes of context where certain strategies are best applied. And finally, and very importantly, I see a, a big gain of, uh, aim of models as being um, serving as communication tools, learning labs for communicating um, with broader stakeholders. Um, I think I'll pretty much confine my, my comments there. Oh, yeah, there is one analogy that I think is an important one. And ladies and gentlemen, particularly for those new to modeling, for whom this is a, an entirely kind of new area, I'd like to draw the analogy between models and maps. 
All of us are familiar with maps at some level or another. For some of the young people, perhaps the primary maps that you know about are, are on your devices. But time was that, that maps were, were um, carried about in physical form. And probably all of you have experienced those at some point um, or another, um, if only to marvel how we ever got by with them. Um, uh, the, the observation here is at several levels. First of all, like maps, all models represent, they try to capture, they try to capture some features of the world in a more stylized or less stylized fashion. And specifically, they represent abstractions of the world. What I mean by that is it's a representation of the world that hides a lot of details, but brings out certain details only. And this capacity to omit details is what makes maps and models useful. Um, you know, if we have a street map, and it's a physical street map, it would be horrendously inconvenient if it had every tree in the city of Melbourne in it, every blade of grass, if it aspired to include every sewer outlet, etc. cetera. Um, it would be inconvenient. It would be hard to fit in our vehicle. Um, like maps, models are specific to purpose in the sense that the detail omitted depends on the goal of the map. If your goal is to try to drive through Melbourne, um, you will use one sort of map. If your goal is to take the public transit, the trams through Melbourne, you use a different sort of map. If your goal is to figure out why flooding is occurring in other areas of Melbourne, you use a, a topographic or hydrological map. And, and if your goal is to figure out why brownouts are occurring in another area, you'll use a different sort of map. Like maps, models are specific to purpose. We build different models depicting aspects of the world with different components based on our needs, what our question is, what our, what our need for the model is. And which details we omit depends how we're going to use it. George Box, the famous statistician, once said that model, all models are wrong, some are useful. He was talking predominantly about statistical models, but it's a general feature of, of models. And you could say the same thing about maps, right? All maps are wrong, yeah, but they're really useful. Um, the map of the streets of Melbourne may be wrong in the sense that it omits so many details about the situation. It's not a depiction of reality, perfect depiction of reality. The only depiction, perfect map of the world is the world itself, and we can't fit it in our car. So we need maps that are simplified, and we need models that are simplified. The challenge with models is it's more difficult to decide a priori what things should be omitted. So within a model, ladies and gentlemen, all those models we saw this morning, all those models that will accompany us this week, there's three distinctions I'd like to make um, between things as we, in terms of the model scope, how things are captured in the model. The, the three distinctions are there are certain things in the model that are endogenous. I actually used that term at one point. I said that discrete event modeling endogenized travel times, meaning it's generated by the model. It's calculated by the model. It's produced by the model. We don't tell the model about endogenous things directly. We don't say, assume this travel time between this point and this point. It is calculated as part of the model. It tells us what those travel times would be based on people's speed, based on how many people there are in the congested uh, pathway, based on the particular routes that are available, et cetera. So endogenous quantities are quantities that the module calculates, and that model of um, where we had that last model we looked at where we had diabetes and weight status, the, the division of the population, what fraction of the population was overweight or obese over time, that was endogenous, produced by the model. We tell it at the start what fraction are obese or overweight, the very start of the model, but after that it tells us, it simulates out over time. By contrast, there are a set of factors that we term exogenous in a model, and this holds across all the types of modeling. All three types. These are factors that are, that are represented in the model. They play a role in the model. Often they'll have effects that they cause in the model, but they're specified in a pre-specified way. We tell them to the model. So we told, well, we told uh, that model concerning food, food, uh, food uh, shopping behavior, we, um, we specified that from GIS maps. We told that Assume this, now, this connectivity between streets, assume this layout, assume that grocery stores are available at these places, that convenience store at these places. What are the implications? 
Um, the implications here are sometimes that it's fixed, but sometimes it may vary in a pre-specified way. It varies over time in this way. We assume, uh, perhaps we assume uh, a um, certain hazard rate of becoming, uh, of initiating smoking that is fixed by age. So in other words, for a given age, it's a certain rate. Or we say how that is fixed by age in a way that varies over time. So we'll examine the effect of rising rates on an age-specific basis over time. The point is it's pre-specified. Before the model runs, we know what it's going to be at a certain time. The model doesn't tell us, we tell the model. And then there are certain quantities that are con often consciously omitted from the model, that are left out of the model. Um, now, capturing more, more factors endogenously makes the model more flexible, gives extra investigative power and accuracy, but it requires more theorizing, more time and resources to build, and it's more challenging to reason about. So you will find some models where there are very few endogenous quantities, and we just want to understand their implications, and we will find some where these are very rich, but, um, but some factors are still exogenous, et cetera. And as we learn about a model, often we will bring things back and forth between these categories, particularly bringing things that are ignored into the model or bringing things that are exogenous to be endogenous, and occasionally the reverse ways. Okay, just wanting to, to finish them, this up, I think I'll leave this um, till uh, a later point. Uh, just a couple of, um, a couple of take home messages. Okay, uh, addressing many practical challenges is, because, is hard because the exhibit features of complex systems. These entangled systems where the behavior of the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And system science provides us with some tools, several tools to, to represent reason about the behavior of complex systems, to, to interact more effectively with these systems, to anticipate their behavior, and to reason about how that behavior will change when we change some feature of the system. These models capture, represent, dynamic hypotheses about the processes underlying observed behavior, and they help us understand what's going on and how interventions might affect things. Models are specific to purpose, and multiple and hybrid modeling types, like we saw this morning, are complementary for describing complex decision-making challenges. Okay? So those are some take-home points. Um, any questions about this before I do a brief description about how these models differ from statistical models? And then we'll break for lunch. Any, any questions? Yeah? So you're doing like meta-modeling, like trying to take your agent model back to something that is easy to understand? Yes, yes. In fact, um, probably the foremost person I know in the world about that, um, the, the very graveyard of that tradition is sitting, sitting right in the back there, uh, Jeff McDonald. And um, I'm, I'm a big user of that approach, but Jeff, um, is is the sage of that approach, um, and um, and it, it's a notable feature when you're using multiple types of modeling that you will sometimes try to use not just mix them together in a given modeling project. You will use one type for a while, and then you will try to construct from the wisdom that's been acquired from that a, a model in a different type and see if it helps give another. Uh, perspective on or, or, or help better understand the phenomenon or boil it down so it's simpler to present to some people. So Jeff uh, in particular has long talked about um, the use of a, a more um, textured model, a more a richer model to explore some issues but then from that modeling set of modeling exercises distilling sort of the heart of the issue so that he can present it to to stakeholders, and uh, I know that he's done much work uh, over time here in Australia trying to translate findings in a form that are useful to, to stakeholders. And I think when we think about um, you know, modeling as learning, a lot of the time we go through episodes where we wouldn't have learned key things without supporting something in the model, but after that we don't need to have that in there anymore. After that, we can let it go. Um, we could say, okay, we really looked into this, and it turns out that's a really secondary issue. And therefore, you exogenize it, or you, you create a version of the model which just omits it. 
you know, and, and be able to explain the patterns without need for, for recourse to that, all that extra complexity. So extremely important, valuable, and I will tell you that a number of our modeling projects have really benefited from simultaneous modeling and separate, uh, using separate approaches and, and comparing the two. And we will find bugs in the model, you know, the other model, but we will also find cases where just our learning is different because of the nature of the representation. And the learning uh, often really informs each other. So Jeff would be a great person to talk to about that. Any other questions? Okay. So uh, what I'm going to do then is uh, I'm just going to stop.